Welcome everyone to Current Explorations channel and our exploration of the 1715 fleet metal detecting on the beaches of the Treasure Coast of Florida. Today I'm going to take you through my experience in November hunting after Hurricane Nicole. For starters, I started off by doing a lot of research like a lot of other people did and also reading the famous book by Kip Wagner, Pieces of Eight. Very interesting read, not really going to help you in terms of treasure hunting, but it's a very, very fascinating read. For starters, I decided to go to the cabin wreck. The reason why I chose the cabin wreck is it seems to be one of the larger wrecks on the site, which is located right here. I stayed at a place um, a little bit south of Sebastian Inlet, which I will show you on a GPS later, um, north of Vero Beach. The reason I chose this wreck is because the cabin wreck and the cannon wreck are not too far from each other. So my train of thought was if I don't find anything at one, I could always go a little bit south or a little bit north and hopefully improve my odds. So what was I hoping to find on this journey? Well, for starters, like any metal detector or treasure hunter, I was hoping to find riches beyond my wildest dreams. Turns out I was not the only person at the beach that day when I arrived. After doing tons of research, reading countless books, earmarking everything I thought was accurate, it turns out when I got to the beach, I was far, far away from what I thought were riches. However, after some perseverance in changing my plan, I was able to come out successful, and I will show you at the end what I was able to uncover. So let's get into the equipment. For starters, I am not a paid spokesperson for any of this. I decided on the gear that I chose just by doing research just like you're doing right now. The GPS I chose was a Garmin 66S. It seemed to be able to zoom me in where I wanted to go, but more than anything, I was more concerned that if the beach were so damaged, the place that I was staying at, I would not be able to find my way back if the dunes were cut that bad. I have read and heard stories of people having to literally jump or slide down eight foot cuts in the sand dunes. So I figured if I had to slide down eight feet, how would I arrive back home? So, let me show you where I was. This is a little map right outside of my little dot right there is where the cabin wreck was. Where I had most of my success was actually a little bit north of that, right up there. It's right by the McClarty Museum. Now, the tricky part was, is if I got to the McClarty Museum, the tide was so high that you would end up getting stuck on one side of a rock wall. For those of you that have been there, you would know that. The rock wall, you would end up getting stuck. So I would have had to have walked a very long distance away to come back around. So the rest of my gear, I used a MindLab Equinox 800 metal detector, which is fantastic, by the way. I also brought a Garrett trowel, just in case I came across anything of substantial size, which eventually I did. It turned out to be an old drain cover. I also took a backpack, which came in handy. Not only could I strap the Garmin here, but as you know, the Florida sun can get hot even after a storm. So I put water bottles here. And the most important thing I found was having a good bug spray, which I use Skin So Soft. The sand gnats, when the sun goes down, are almost unbearable. So what all is in the bag that I took? Well, for starters, you want to keep it lightweight. A couple of water bottles end up weighing a decent amount, and then if you find some stuff, any trash, anything like that, you want to be able to take that away as well. So what is in the bag that I carried? It only weighed about two pounds minus the water. I had some spare batteries for my GPS and my pinpointer as well. I also had a backup battery for my Equinox, which I never had to use because the battery power on the Equinox 800 is exceptionally well. Had an extra glass shield um, for the Garmin as well, just in case it fell into the water. And a couple coin flips, coin holders in case I found something 
um, as Gary Drayton would call a top pocket find. Underneath, this is something I would strongly suggest, especially if you're going to the beach. There is a lot of beach traffic down there, no matter what time of year you go. But when you go after a hurricane and it's daylight out, there are tons and tons and tons of people. The most success I had is when I strapped one of these headlamps on my head and I went out and there was nobody out there. When I found the majority of my finds I'll show you later, I found them between the hours of midnight and 5 a.m. when there was only one other person on the beach and he was surfing, um, I'm sorry, fishing in the surf. I have backups on backups. So I have two of these in case one fails. That's your worst nightmare is driving five hours to do something and having, uh, having something break on you. I also brought a solar power lantern. Also in my truck, I had um, extra gasoline and I also had an inverter in the back of the truck in case I showed up and there was no power at the house I was staying at. Turns out there was, but I was fully prepared, ready to go in case there wasn't. Extra stuff for the mine lab, extra chargers, screen cleaner. Very important as well, extra cell phone charger. Pick up for a couple bucks, it was battery powered, hence the extra batteries that I had. And I also brought a little bit of a first aid kit with me. Now, you will get beat up in the sand a little bit. You could step on rocks. I would suggest wearing shoes. I would not go barefoot if it were me, not only for digging. Um, I wouldn't wear flip-flops either, but a good pair of sand um, or water shoes would work excellent. Um, I had a pair of water shoes that stuck through me. I would bring a couple pairs, though, because everything you wear on day one will be absolutely soaked on day two. This was the pouch that I carried with me, which I found out very fast fills up in a hurry with all the trash on the beach. Some detectors were nice and took their trash with them. Other people literally dug up cans and threw them to the side, which I was happy to recycle myself. Luckily for me, I had my backpack on as well and had extra garbage bags with me that I was able to put to the side and come back later for. Once I started digging targets, which came up plenty, I found the most important thing that I needed was actually a sand scoop, just as much as I needed a good detector. I will show you a picture of the first sand scoop that I went with, thinking that I could get away cheaply, which was obviously a rookie mistake, as the pictures will show you. Digging through sand coral that's, you know, a foot deep, uh, it's a little bit challenging, and slowly but surely, within about two hours, the scoop looked like this. Luckily, I had brought a CKG, very heavy duty, carbon fiber handle scoop with me that ended up saving the day at the end. So I also brought with me a good pair of Garrett gloves um, which for whatever reason I didn't wear to start until one of the first holes I dug through. I tried to reach down with my hands and ended up stabbing my finger with a rusty fish hook. Luckily tetanus is up to date, but it didn't feel good nonetheless. Very crucial to wear those while at the beach. Pinpointer. I didn't end up using a pinpointer. Now if I'm going, you know, in fields or anything like that, I usually um, will go with the Garrett carrot. Also have a lanyard with it to make sure if I leave it. Um, I don't forget about it. Reason that I didn't use that is my method was I would scoop with one hand and detect with the other. I would take the scoop, I'd pick up whatever I could out of the hole, I'd run the detector over the hole, see if anything was still down there. If the target was still down there, I'd quickly throw the sand away and scoop as fast as I could, rinse and repeat. Issue with that is if you're in the surf or close to it, Anytime the waves come in, it will literally refill the hole. So my method was put my foot in the hole to at least mark the spot and then try and time up the waves. 
develop a little bit of a pattern, see what worked out. There were a lot of really, really good targets that I was not able to recover simply because it was too dangerous, the waves were too tall, or I was physically exhausted doing this method. Working with a partner, had I had somebody go with me, would probably have been more successful, but it was just me by myself this trip. So all of this leads up to what did I find? Aside from ridiculous amounts of aluminum cans, trash, fishing lures, sinkers, um, oddly enough, I didn't find a pop top, uh, a pop tab until day two. Didn't find one on day one when I searched for about 12 hours. Day two, I searched for about nine hours. I found probably three dozen of them. And that's when the beach was to myself. So one of the cool things I found on day two was this piece of hardwood. Now, you know, I'm not an archeologist. I can't date things very well in terms of age, but this thing is as hard as hard can get. It's as solid as it is the day that I brought it up. Thought it was pretty cool, brought it home, even if it's not a 1715 fleet piece of wood. I just thought it was a really cool thing, maybe to hang on the wall, something like that. Now the next thing you will notice when you're coming to the beach, especially at night when there's not too many people there during high tide is the amount of crazy shells that you will find there. Some of these shells like this one here to give you an idea is about the size of my hand. There were literally some probably five to six times the size of this one right here. But really cool shells. I brought a few home for my kids because I figured they'd appreciate them. But these were literally littering the beach. Um, but really, really cool shells, great spot to shell hunt. If you're not a treasure hunter, it'd be an awesome spot just to lay on the beach, see really, really blue, um, that kind of aqua blue water. Um, it would have been a good time to surf, obviously probably a little dangerous for a novice, um, but really, really awesome time nonetheless. And now for what everybody has been waiting for. Not a whole lot of detail to really make out much of anything, on it, but it was heavily encrusted. I think there's a little tiny, maybe a cross right there or something. It's heavily encrusted as I will show you. Um, instead of doing electrolysis, I chose um, to do a little olive oil method and to slowly, slowly break away all the crust and shells and everything that were on this one. I'll show you kind of the before picture. This is the after. It weighs about two grams. My guess would be if it is, uh, in fact, a coin, it would be a half rail. The next piece that I picked up was something pretty common across the beach. Um, at first I thought it was birkenite, um, and it still may be, but I know the Challenger explosion um, happened and a lot of that stuff still washes up. This seems like it had been in the water quite some time. I pulled this out just like it sits right here. Still has some of the incrustation. You can see some of the shells and everything right there too. Pretty large piece though. So towards the tail end of day one, this was my big find. I found this a lot further north than I thought I would, uh, about a mile and a half further north than what my target stopping point was. Uh, a lot of people that were detecting, and I probably passed three or four dozen, which makes it a little bit challenging because you see all these other holes and you kind of get discouraged that, hey, anything of value has already been picked over. I happened to uh, follow one gentleman that went past the McClarty Museum, but he was outpacing me by probably five to one. His sweeps were fast. He wasn't really covering ground the way that I would like to you know, cover ground. He was walking straight lines versus kind of more of a grid or a zigzag pattern. Um, and I found this right at the water line, uh, about eight inches down and I was absolutely ecstatic. I was getting eaten alive by bugs at that point, um, but this is by far what I thought would be the coolest find that I would ever find in my life. The very last find that I found when I thought things couldn't get better with a piece of eight was a Chuascudo Spanish gold coin. 
found this one around 4 a.m. A little bit further past where I found the 8 rail the previous day. So all in all, my experience was fantastic. I stayed at a really cool house on the beach. Um, I'm glad that I had power. I took camping food that essentially I could just pour hot water in if I needed it. I was fully prepared to sleep in my truck if I needed to. Um, found some amazing artifacts. I searched for probably 20, 24 hours total. Um, I did not stop. I was tired for probably the next week or so. I was sore all over the place, but it 100% paid off. Um, I plan to go down uh, in a couple months and hopefully do this again. Gonna try and go a little bit further down south if I can to the Douglas Beach wreck. Um, I heard you know, some rumors on the beach, gotta take them for what they are. Heard some rumors of people finding some gold down there as well as some gemstones, uh, emeralds and amethysts down there as well. Um, I'd like to take my kids down there and maybe sift through some, you know, some shells at the waterline, see if I can't find any emeralds. Going to try and shoot a couple live videos too. Um, I did not have a YouTube page when this happened, but I was encouraged by a lot of other people on Reddit and some other sources to maybe document, you know, what happened. Um, but talking to a lot of other people on the beach too, I ran into some people that had other success. Uh, one gentleman had found two two escudo gold coins and one four escudo gold coins in a six foot circle um other people that seem to be walking a little bit faster you know maybe people that live there that were just you know kind of well i'm going to take my detector out and see if i can't find anything um, they didn't have so much luck the dunes weren't cut nearly as deep as i thought they would be people were thinking eight to ten feet these were cut three to five feet maybe um, and then it's definitely frowned upon to search, you know, right off of where these cuts are as well. Um, you've got people's yards right there, you know, uh, docks, things like that, or little patios that I shouldn't say docks, little patios that people sit on. Um, so there were a lot of, you know, people cleaning their own debris out of the beach and things like that, not really taken too kindly to the metal, <clears throat> metal detectors, but as long as you're respectful, they seem to treat us pretty well, uh, also. Well, I thank you guys again so much for watching. Um, I hope you see some of my other videos. Please like and subscribe. I would surely appreciate it. Like I said, in a couple months, uh, I'm going back down to the Treasure Coast uh, for another 1715 search, as well as I'm going to try my luck for 1733 fleet down in the Florida Keys. And we'll shoot some videos and take some pictures and things like that. If you have any questions, uh, please comment below. Feel free to ask away. I'll do my best. I'm no, uh, by no means a professional treasure hunter metal detector. I think I may have had a little beginner's luck here. Outside of this, I've only done, you know, some backyard searches, a couple small farms, things like that. Never really had anything pan out outside of, you know, some kind of basic silver coins, some coppers, you know, things like that. But never thought in a million years I'd find anything like this. Thank you again. Again, please like and subscribe. If you have any questions, I'm all ears. I'd be happy to answer.